In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. A very good evening and a warm welcome to you. My name is Jürgen Schonnefong and I will be your moderator for tonight. Um, we're broadcasting from Pakhuis de Zwijger, but from an empty room. Two weeks ago, we've started uh, with our live casts. And even though the live casts are born out of necessity because of the regulations around COVID-19, um, we've actually started to enjoy this, uh, this new form of addressing themes that are important for the city. This is our second edition, the second edition of We Make the City Reset. The world is turned upside down, um, the streets are empty, behind the scenes, behind the empty cities and behind the seemingly tranquility there's a storm raging that ravages through our values and known structures. But instead of regarding this period as a temporary break from our normal lives, could we also take this time for a complete reset? How can we restructure existing and sometimes dysfunctional systems? In this new series, we will showcase the perspective of a variety of thinkers. They will reflect on the present day situation and they will do that through the lens of their own area of expertise, but with an emphasis on the creative industry. Because the Corona crisis is, of course, without a doubt, a crisis that leaves behind a trail of victims. But are there also any transformations that we will be left with in the aftermath that can benefit us? During these times, uh, it's the creatives who can visualize new scenarios uh, and, and can develop new insights into our future. Our guest, main guest tonight, I have to say, is Farid Tabarki. He's the founding director of Studio Zeitgeist. He's a regular contributor to the Financiële Dagblad, a Dutch daily newspaper focusing on finance and eco economy. And in 2017, his first book, The End of the Middle, was published in English. A very warm welcome to you, Farid. Please join me on stage. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. How did you experience these past three weeks that are a bit surreal? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know about you. Oh, it took me a week to like get adjusted to it or like to find a new normality, if you can call it like that. But after a week, I kind of, yeah, managed to look to the new horizon that we are seeing now. I'm very curious to see what that new horizon is and you've prepared a presentation. I did. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much. Um, yes, hello, everybody. Um, we're now celebrating uh, a period of Easter. Um, so um, we're probably also searching for some Easter eggs, or probably we have done so in the last couple of days. Um, and with this, I would like to start my talk, uh, searching for Easter eggs. Because Easter eggs is not only a thing we did in the last couple of days because of celebrating Easter, but Easter eggs are also part of the creative industry because they can be seen in games and in films. Maybe you know this phenomenon of Easter eggs somewhere hidden in a film or a game. Let's lo have a look to a film which has such an Easter egg and let's see what, what that means for our talk of, of, uh, of, of today. Uh, here we see E.T., a uh, beautiful film from the 80s. And here E.T. Uh, sees Joda from Star Wars in the film E.T., which is kind of surprising. Why is Joda in a film like E.T.? Well, of course, E.T. thinks that Joda is from his galaxy, so he wants to go home, and Joda for him is his home. Uh, it's a nice reference from E.T. to Star Wars. Then a couple of years later, Star Wars introduced an Easter egg with E.T. Here we see um, uh, this clip from Star Wars, The Phantom Menace from 1999. And there's a little Easter egg in this in this little clip, because we see here a big conference of all these galaxies uh, coming uh, together. But if we look really closely again, then we can see an Easter egg. If you put on pause, we saw E.T. in Star Wars. So here we see little Easter egg in a film. But we only see the Easter egg in a film or a game if we put on pause. If we use the pause button to see what's actually hidden in there as a message, as a way of a new layer in our story. Now for today, I would like to explore with you Easter eggs in our current society. 
a, a society which is ravaged by the virus and of course what does it mean for the future let's look for easter eggs let's let's push the pause button and see what happens to our societies at the moment um, and for this this is of course a video of the societies we've been used to just three to four weeks ago we were bustling we were busy like here in the champs elysees in paris and then just a couple of weeks later, we can see the Champs-Élysées completely empty out, as are most spaces, most cities, most squares, most places in our cities. We're put on pause. Now, the great thing about a pause, like Easter eggs, is we can see what's hidden uh, behind the, the real story. And for this, I would like to take you on what are the hidden um, uh, stories within the current crisis and what does it mean for the future developments, for our future society, for our future cities. Because this, of course, is the uh, Easter egg, which is not that much hidden, is it? This is our society we've been building up for the last 200 years. 200 years ago, we started the Industrial Revolution, and since then, most of our societies are still organized like that. If we look to how our organizations work, a very hierarchical way of approaching our organizations, very industrial in a way. If we think about our current educational system, still so much a very industrial way of learning and industrial way of trying to get people ready for the labor market. Or think about how our economy, how we treat our resources, a very linear way, an industrial way of, 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 of wasting so many resources of our planet. Well, this is not an Easter egg, is it? This is the societies we know and which have now been ground, grounded to a whole. Um, but now, let's look, really look to the real Easter egg in our societies. Because, yes, we are now in the final days of the Industrial Revolution. But now the question becomes, what is then uh, replacing it? What comes, um, uh, what, what, which, which comes part after this crisis? And I think this beautiful graph shows what the Easter egg, Easter egg is in our societies. Uh, since 200 years, we've been doing many, many inventions. And the interesting thing is, these inventions are increasingly more and more having impact on our societies and faster, accelerating. 200 years ago, it took maybe 60, 70 years to use the steam machine in, in an economical and societal way. But then we follow the graph, we're coming closer and closer to current age, and every invention we do closer to our age, the, the faster accelerated the impact it has on our societies. When it comes to electricity, when it comes to the telephone, and eventually, of course, the internet. Something we invent yesterday is going to be impacted on our societies tomorrow, way faster than 200 years ago. Now, of course, the big question comes, okay, so what does it mean, this kind of a transformation? Because if we look to the past, we see an industrial time, but we also saw the new time with an accelerating change of inventions impacting our societies. What kind of transformation then can we see in our societies? For this, it would be nice to do a little experiment. I think we are here in an environment and you're watching, um, which, uh, which are people, I think, which like to do experiments. And I think an experiment shows really nicely what the transformation is, what the transformation is all about. I would like to go with you to the Arctic Circle, where it's really, really cold. It's minus 45, and this person has a hot um, um, uh, pan of boiling water in his hands. What happens with a, hot, uh, a pan of hot uh, boiling water when you throw it up in the air, in an environment of minus 45? Here you see it. We see a transformation. Something was liquid a split second before it was entered into the air and then it became solid. And this is of course all about physics. This is what shows this beautiful experiment. If you change the context of a molecule, of a society, then the society, a molecule, changes into a new phase. If it's cold, like the Industrial Revolution, everything becomes solid, the hierarchies, the educational system, and when things are heating up, it becomes liquid, and if it even heats up a little bit more, it becomes in a gas state. And that's the Easter egg. That's what's currently happening in our society for the last couple of decades. Under, under this industrial revolution, there was something going on, the acceleration of inventions, the impact it has on our, on, our, on, our, on our societies. So our environment is increasingly getting hotter. Unfortunately, the planet is getting hotter, so it's also a literal meaning, but I, of course, mean it more as a metaphor. Because what we see is that our society is melting. 
our ice caps are melting, but also our society and the structures of our societies. We are turning into a liquid society. That's something that we can look forward to or we have to embrace after this crisis we are facing at the moment. Now, Zygmunt Bauman, a Polish-British philosopher, he for the first time um, developed this idea of the liquid society. And he gave this definition to that time. Change is the only uh, permanence and uncertainty is the only certainty. That's how he defined this coming age, this new phase of our societies after the crisis. Um, and I must be honest with you. Um, he, and also I don't think, this is a new utopia. It's not something which is going to be easy to grasp because think about it. A time of permanent change and permanent uncertainty. That's something which has been growing in our societies and that's going to be impacting, of course, our lives, our cities and our societies. Uh, but it's, I think it's uh, the right analysis to make and we should then think about what does it mean for our cities, what does it mean for our societies. Because the impact is huge. I wrote a book about the end of the middle, uh, which is a phenomenon uh, uh, linked to the liquid society. Where's the middle if everything becomes liquid, becomes networked, becomes horizontal? Uh, what happens to the middle class? What happens to the retail? Already sectors in great trouble before the crisis, the corona crisis, and even in further trouble in the, in the crisis we're currently in. What does it mean for our cities, our villages? What does it mean for the employability of people who are actually quite hard to employ Anyway, um, let's think about that impact um, uh, when we think about this future society that we are dealing with. Now the question becomes, what do we do after the pause that we are currently in because of the crisis? Do we resume to business as usual, that our cities are going on like they did, that our society is going on, that the government's the economy? Or do we choose for the reset? Is it time for a reset? because it's time to say goodbye to the Industrial Revolution and it's, it's, it's time to say to embrace this new time, this liquid society. Now it becomes really interesting, because what does a global crisis do? A global crisis does two things. On the one hand, it tries to embrace uh, the old times, and the old structures we know, this, in, this time, in this time, the industrial structures, we know them. So we use them because they are our safe havens. We have the nation state and it's saving us from this crisis. It doesn't, but it feels like it does, of course. That's one component of a global crisis like this. But there's another component to a global crisis like this. Because it also embraces the new things which are possible in our societies. And we've been seeing that in the last couple of weeks. Today, here in Pakhuis we are embracing technology to still have this conversation with you about our future societies. We're embracing technology in education, in health. For the first time, we're really using the power of these new possibilities to create a society for now, to uh, make links because we can't meet in real life. But in the future, of course, we'll make a hybrid model uh, out of this. I really liked this quote in the New York Times from Rebecca Sohit. Um, she wrote in the New York Times, every disaster shakes loose the old order. The sudden catastrophe changes the rules and demands new and different responses, but what, what those will be is the subject of battle. It's a beautiful quote and it says something about that we're shaking off the, world, the, new, the, the old order and we're trying to new, uh, develop this new, this new time, this liquid society. Now let me, with you, look to what does it mean? What three things should we do as societies? What are the challenges we're facing if we're embracing this time of change, which is not only this time of change, but the future time of change? What is needed? Well, in the essence, this is needed if you want to adapt to a, to a time where change is always there. The change is not only in the last couple of three, four weeks. The change will be permanent in our societies also after this crisis. What do we develop? What do we have to develop if we are dealing with a liquid society with permanent change? Resilience. Resilience, of course, is the answer, something we have to develop if we want to be able to adapt to the change which is constantly around us also in the future years to come. Um, and um, resilience is about two th three things. It's about anticipation, it's about recovery, and it's about adaptation. It's also making, trying to find the new ways. Now let's look to three different ways of approaching our sectors and how we can build in resilience in these three different sectors. Uh, and let's start, of course, with the educational system. Uh, how do we learn, how do we become resilient learners in a change where we have to adapt all the time, all over? Um, 
And of course, the educational system is a system where we used to put lots of knowledge in our heads, and then the professional's ready for his or her the rest of the lifetime as a professional. But is that really what is needed when you have to adapt all the time to new ways of learning? Isn't lifelong learning a way more interesting concept to introduce than just put into knowledge into somebody's head until you see he or she is 16, 18, and then the he or she is ready for the professional for the rest of his life? Of course not. Um, learning has to be a cycle of learning, unlearning, and relearning. Because what we learn today is maybe not useful in a week or in two weeks, so we have to unlearn again and then relearn. These cycles have to be part of our lives, so not only for future generations and the educational system, but also, of course, for the professionals currently on the labor market and which need, really need lifelong learning, li lifelong learning of skills to be able to be part of the labor market of the future. And learning can mean, can mean so many things within institutions, but also we can be the learners to each other. All generations learning to new generations and new generations learning stuff to all the generations. Happening in the last couple of weeks, of course, because we have to be high learners because of this new uh, adaptation and this new development, but hopefully we can do so also in the future. Um, the second element that we have to create resilience in, resilience in our organizations. How do we how do we do that? Because hierarchies, the current way of organizing ourselves, is not very adaptable. It's very hard to make a change to adapt, to become resilient if you are formed in the hierarchies, top-down way of organizing yourselves. And then the question becomes, yeah, but how do you create flow then? How do you create flow uh, within the systems that we currently have and how do you develop these new systems? Um, and we have a beautiful example last couple of weeks, of course, because we were thinking, we were afraid that the internet would break because we were at home, we're watching all these streaming material, we were, we were working at home using all these new technologies, so we were afraid that the internet couldn't keep up with this online life we're now living every 24 seven a day. Um, but the internet didn't break. If the internet was a hierarchical way of organizing itself, yes, then it would have been broken. But the internet is a network of networks. A network of networks are resilient because if one node doesn't function, you go with your data package to the next node. So decentralization, networks in themselves, are resilient ways of organizing yourselves in times of crisis. Um, the NHS had this great notion of, okay, we have lots of people who need care in the UK, uh, we can't provide them themselves with our professionals, let's create the NHS volunteer app. 750,000 people are now ed dedicated to the NHS to work out, to help people outside their homes if they need any help uh, in, their, in their lives. So here the NHS created a network of almost a million people to create the services to, to the people who need the service the most. Great examples of collaboration between institutions, between, between citizens, to create the service that people need and, and in, in, in dire need, but also hopefully in the future. Because this need for collaboration, this, this, this is becoming resilient in a time of permanent change, is of course something we already have been seeing in the last couple of years. We see many sectors, the European Commission with a big research program where they wanted interdisciplinary working, a top soccer game like Barcelona, creating a hub with all kinds of organizations around Barcelona to, to become the best uh, city and the best soccer game, but also pharmaceuticals like Johnson & Johnson, creating hubs and labs where people start collaborating with without the, the, the need for a, a concrete proposal, but just to see how can we solve complex issues. And then there is, of course, the third big question, how do we create resilient economies? Um, and you would say, well, globalization is a networked economy, right? So what are you talking about? We, already, we are networked, so this is a very resilient system. Uh, but of course it's not. It was shown uh, the last couple of weeks, hey, globalization, on a pass is not really fun functioning well because all these materials we now need can't be, can't be found. But if it's even worse, it's not resilience because it's depleting our planet, because we're not taking care of the resources in, uh, in the fashion that we should. So if we think about a resilient um, economy, a resilient way of organizing our economies and our resources, we're thinking, of course, about the, uh, the circular economy, which is a much more resilient system of keeping us, ourselves, and our planet alive than the old globalization model with some, something in, something out, and what do we do with what's left. It's time to conclude and have the conversation about, about this need for resilience in a time of permanent change. Yes, we've been facing radical changes in the last couple of weeks, but this change will be a permanent part of our societies. What do we do with it? 
while creating resilience. Creating resilience for professionals, for ourselves, by, be, by being educated all the time, creating resilience in our organizations, in the networks we are going to create, because they are resilient by themselves, and by creating, finally, the circular economy, and therefore, we'll have a resilient planet. So, what do we do? What kind of person should we look at when we think about these unchartered territories that we're currently in? What kind of attitude do we take with us? What is the right attitude to deal with this new way of living, this liquid society, which will pop up after this big crisis? There was one person I could think of. Uh, you already pro pro all know her probably uh, from, uh, from, from ancient times. Huh? Here she is, uh, Pippi um, 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 uh, Lovingstock. Um, 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 a great kick from, 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 from Sweden, and uh, she had a great attitude when it comes to um, the issues that we're having in our society. Because what was the morale of Pippi? Pippi always said, uh, I've never done that before, so I'm sure I can do it. And with that attitude, I'm sure we'll create resilient cities, resilient people, resilient societies. And that's what we need for the coming years. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. And there was a lot, a lot to to, to fathom. Yeah. Um, what I took from it, the liquid societies that we have to get used to uh, require uh, resilience, resilience for us, and yeah. that requires scenarios as well that we didn't develop yet. So in the past couple of weeks, we've seen that we, as governments as well, but as a society, we are capable of instant change, of improvising. Yeah. Um, is that um, a, a sustainable form? of leading a country or leading a life because um, people, you know, they thrive on security. Yeah. Um, how do you, how can we deal with it? What is our, your advice for us to yeah. deal with that change? Well, I mean, this is a great start for our conversation because um, it's, it's not so much a question of, of do we like it or not. I mean, if you, th if you look to how our societies are changing, how much inventions we're making are impacting our lives, are changing our lives, it is better to get used to what we have been used to in the last couple of weeks and take that knowledge towards how we function in the, in, in the future. Uh, the great thing also is, because you're right, people want, want, want basic income, they want, they, 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 they want, uh, they want some, uh, some stability in their lives. So we have this uh, discussion now about basic income. We have the discussion about how do people become employable for the rest of their life and they keep on learning. So mm -hmm. these, these are the notions I think which are very important to make sure that what stable lives mean stable economies, stable um, um, uh, learning approaches to the labor market, but also um, uh, making sure that people have the opportunities they, they get mm -hmm. to, um, to have a better life. Right, but, but it's also um, um, resilience is, is, is in this day and age, even if you look at our own society, um, you can be resilient if you have the resources, either the financial resources or the networks. Um, if you do not have that, how do you deal with being resilient? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, um, I, for, for the sake of conversation, for, for discussion, I, I, would, I would say the opposite. I think especially in countries or areas or cities where there's a weak state, uh, you see very resilient networks of people uh, together in their village, in their neighborhoods, uh, and they cr create the services and the resilience themselves by, by creating the networks they need. Mm -hmm. You can also say that the nation state and our way of creating the welfare state made us less resilient mm -hmm. because now we see what we're dealing with if, if we have these issues. So maybe this interconnectedness, which many people already have, is something to look positive to and use in our current systems. But of course, you're also right. When you don't have the means, when you are struggling with, uh, with, with access to education, of course, it's terrible what's happening now because you lack the education you already have. So, of course, there are issues for different groups, but I wouldn't say that only one group is affected by this more specifically. Mm. Can, can, you have, can you give us any examples of people without that you know, many resources that created networks that are resilient? Yeah, but I, but I, I, th I think, I mean, what's also fascinating about this discussion about, um, uh, in, I think everyone in, in his or her neighborhood knows a place, knows a person who is, who is this person, who is this node in your neighborhood where you go to for information, if you want to check with somebody, if he or she is well. Uh, I think in every neighborhood in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, outside the Netherlands, we all know people who have this function. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how do we empower these people mm -hmm. to be in place and not get overworked? Because lots of these people get, get totally stressed out and burned out because 
this whole neighborhood is 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 using them uh, for for the for for their resources. Uh, so the question becomes: How do you create um, a system around these people that make the connections and that make people which are well left out are not coping with it uh, ideally can still be part of this new way of working, this new way of uh, of, uh, of of living. And that means also a, a greater sense of solidarity. To, to make sure that everybody is included, even the people without the resources, but with the networks. Um, on, a global, on a European scale, we see the so-called lack of solidarity because of the um, stance that our uh, Minister of Finances takes, Hoekstra, to in regard to the Italian economy and our versus our Dutch economy. Um, can you talk about solidarity a bit in that regard? <laughs> that regard, uh, yeah. It's. I mean, I mean, if in this this time of of, of age we're not going to work together, and that's also my 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 whole statement during uh, during my, uh, my during my talk. It's killing. I mean, then mm. we're not going to really work it out because I think in this really connected age where change is so rapidly, we have to really de de also depend on others. I mean, for now we can do it ourselves, but who knows in two, three weeks what happens. So it's better to to have many options and to, if, 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 if things get better with Italy, maybe we need Italy back then because mm -hmm. we are in a crisis uh, for, for, for some reason. So I think in in a, in a time of constant change, it's always good to have the, the, the great relations because you will never know when you when it's your turn. Who you um, need in the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and in that regard, will Europe be more or less divided after this crisis? Will we be brought together? Oh, or that's, yeah. Will it tear us apart? That's a, that's a very tough um, uh, question because, uh, I, as I also said in my talk, um, uh, a crisis like this does two things. It reinforces the old, uh, like the nation state we can see now, but it also embraces the new. And here we see a dilemma. Uh, if we embrace the new, the, we embrace, of course, international cooperation, uh, international solidarity, we embrace the neighborhood, the city, the regional way of organizing ourselves, uh, regional solidarity, where this nation state is actually less needed because we do it in, 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 in cities and in the regions. Uh, we do it on the, on the international level, cities cooperating on the international level. Uh, there's not so much left there for the nation state. So. It's, it's tough now to make a, the right prediction, but if I look at the long-term trend and what we need, uh, if we want to adapt to fast change, we can do it way better on the city, in the very regional level, and then do some international cooperation, then this yeah, national level, which has been very efficient for the last 200 years, don't get me wrong, but I'm not sure if it's going to be very efficient for the coming 200 years. Right. Um, steady goes a long way, you know, when you know what, what you're dealing with, you can anticipate. Uh, you're talking about constant change. Um, if you look into your, you know, into the future, which you can't and also can do, um, can you say that this constant change um, is? Can we regard it as a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, who that 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 depends on who you ask. I mean, I like it, you know. Uh -huh. So so personally, uh, I, I'm I'm fine with change. Now I think it's a nuance. I mean, if we look to the long term trend, the last two hundred years. The change has been for the better. If we look to poverty rates on the global scale, mm -hmm. uh, they diminished in East Asia, South, South Asia. So it, it depends on how you look. I think some change has been for the better. Mm -hmm. uh, we have internet, so we're now still connected, although we can't go outside, which is great. So I think these are very positive changes that, 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 that we are embracing. But of course, there are negative aspects to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fear people have of what's new, can I adapt to the new? Mm -hmm. um, I think our goal is, and, and should be, prepare people to make them resilient uh, to, so they can embrace the change. And I think and everybody can develop resilience by understanding how, what the future looks like, having the skills which meet with the labor market also in the future. That's something we can work on. But you can't understand what the future looks like if the future is constantly changing. So you cannot anticipate on you know, the situations that's going to happen in the future or that you have to deal with in the future. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yes and no, because, because uh, if, if this future is this, is this notion of liquid society, then you see organizing principles based around this society. Yeah? So, so it's, 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 it's arranged around networks, it's, it's arranged around openness, around, around transparency. So if you, took the, if you take these principles, you can organize yourself around that. I mean, mm. that's, that's not... That's not uh, a hollow, uh, hollow thinking that, that's very concrete and so you can actually make it very tangible if you want to do it. Right. Um, thank you so much for now. But uh, we're joined now in our conversation by Marina Otero-Vergier. 
She's an architect based in Rotterdam, and she's also the director of research at the Nieuwe Institute. Uh, the Nieuwe Institute, of course, is the Dutch Institute for Architecture, Design and Digital Culture. Marina, a very warm welcome to you. Hello. Hi. Um, you have you live in, in, in Rotterdam, you're based in Rotterdam at the moment, and you also have been confronted with our new reality. How do you deal with this new reality? I mean, I have been very difficult weeks. I have a very... Um, privileged situation. I am, I'm healthy. I have a stable uh, job and I have a house where to stay safely. Um, but I'm very worried for many other people who is not in the same situation as I am. So trying to uh, help and support them as much as possible. How do you do that? Well, I have a, a job that uh, deals with the creative sector, so we are very much also willing to uh, define ways in, in which we can still support the field, support the uh, artists, designers, the freelancers in particular, trying to uh, also be in contact with all the students uh, that are generally uh, teaching and give them a sense of stability and, and support and care. So. Yeah, and also, of course, with family and friends. My family is in Spain, so they are also having a, a difficult time. Yeah, Spain, of course, have been very hard hit by by the coronavirus as well. So mm -hmm. I hope uh, they're they're uh, they're doing well. Um, in regard to the artists and the designers that you work with, um, we are heading, so to speak, to a very bleak future because um, in a previous program that I did uh, earlier uh, uh, past week. It was said, being said, and Prime Minister agreed on that as well, it will take a very long time before we get back to what we can conceive as normal. And a lot of artists, a lot of people will, you know, um, will be faced with that new reality and professionally won't survive. Um, how do you deal with that at the New Institute? Um, well, first of all, more generally, I, I'm an architect, as you said, and I experienced already the uh, crisis, the financial crisis in the, from the 2007 uh, onwards. And obviously that created a complete transformation of the discipline of architecture and, and the way in which we uh, work and how we work and in which projects we work, etc. And it was difficult. I think we could have learned uh, more from that particular situation. And now I think, uh, you know, there are resources. There are a lot of resources to redistribute. Um, we have to be very wise in how we actually redistribute that wealth and uh, through the maximum number of people right now. Mm. I think that's the key question. I'm very much in favor, maybe it's a socialist approach, but the uh, redistribution of wealth. And that's what actually public institutions have to do, uh, because in a way we concentrate a lot of the um, uh, you know, resources uh, that the government allocates and it's our also uh, responsibility to make sure that this not only reach to certain individuals, but also to make sure that other forms of institutional making, other forms of collectives, practices, and, and structures that are in the city and the cities uh, need them, are fundamental for the life of the cities, keep on uh, existing and working. Uh, so I think that's uh, quite important to to realize, and and yeah, this we are defining now ways to to do it. Yeah, yeah, and redistributing wealth and having solidarity in that sense, I think, is very important. Um, you've also heard Farid's uh, presentation. He talked about the liquid societies. He talked about constant change. Um, what is your vision on on what Farid told us? Yeah, it was a, a fantastic and very engaging presentation. Uh, I'm so great, very grateful to Farid for that. Uh, it's a lot of food for thought. I, I agree in, in many of the points he raised. I have been uh, particularly interested in questions of liquidity and circulatory processes in the last years. And for me, what is very interesting and even paradoxical is that there was a moment, um, maybe a, a decade ago, a little less, that we were totally fascinated by this idea of the transformation, liquidity, the ongoing circulation of people, information, capital, goods, etc. 
And uh, that was creating a transformation of belonging, of our ideas of uh, where do we belong, uh, what we call a home. So for instance, we had Airbnb, what we call property. So we had all these shari sharing platforms, even questions about national identity uh, with ideas about, about transnational uh, citizenship. For instance, also the idea of Estonia to have the e-citizenship. So suddenly there was a new horizon of very much uh, liquid society and fluidity. But simultaneously, we also saw Brexit, we saw the uh, wall between uh, the US and Mexico, many fences and borders erected as a result of the so-called refugee crisis in Europe and also in other countries, and so on and so forth. So there was these two uh, um, you know, opposite movements that on the one hand were trying to create much more circulation and connectedness, and on the other were trying to go back to this other space of the national uh, nation state. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the question of the, the epidemic right now, the pandemic, has um, visualized all these questions about what it means to be connected, what are the implications, and also all these other movements, counter movements to create a more conservative idea of the identity and belonging are actually being in place. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm not really in uh, complete support of this idea of liquidity, because we can see, and, and see Farid has also referred to that, how this idea of circulation and continuous mobility has many times been connected to precarity. Mm -hmm. uh, so precarization of labor, uh, massive concentrations of wealth, and dispossession in other populations. So I think we have to see how these ongoing circulations uh, don't allow people to circulate uh, evenly. So some people circulate uh, in a precarious and even forced way. And uh, so, yeah, there opens a lot of different questions right now. So if we are facing a, a future of uncertainty. Uh, we have to be prepared also for how to uh, combine this uncertain future with sense, uh, certain forms of uh, also stability that would allow us to thrive even in the most, um, you know, surprising and unexpected conditions. Mm. You, you said that it's uh, very precarious. Those circular systems for some people are very precarious, uh, leading to dispossession, uh, dispossession uh, as well. Is there a way to um, prevent that? Is there a way to change the system so even the circular systems are benefiting more people than they are doing now? Uh, I, I've seen in the, obviously there are many projects connected to that and uh, especially interested, for instance, Farid referred to, um, well, many different things that for me are key. This idea of experimenting, this idea of allowing to commit mistakes, and uh, but also how to have, navigate the uncertainty with mutual confidence. And also this idea of networking. And th if you think about that, uh, if we are in a state of continuous change, the only way in which, as in my understanding, that we can uh, still thrive and we can uh, still act as a society is by having a base that allow us to have this confidence. And obviously that creates uh, networks of solidarity. And with solidarity again, and maybe in my uh, socialist uh, side, I believe in that there is to be a redistribution of, of wealth. Uh, but also I think that the crisis is putting on the uh, spotlight questions as the question of housing. Mm -hmm. For instance, now it's fundamental to have a place to stay. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now, until now, the house has been most of the times an asset that it has been used for speculation and real estate development uh, and uh, you know accumulation of capital rather than really a right. So I think if we all have access to certain infrastructures uh, like a home or if I said education, health, those things to me are still extremely relevant. And I'm talking about a base from which then we can all, uh, you know, mm. live uh, our life. In that sense, I just uh, thinking also about logistics and infrastructure uh, because we are all talking about internet. But there, there is a lot of debates right now as well as how we can use internet but actually not being benefiting only a few companies. So mm -hmm. there's many talks about collectivizing or making these infrastructures public. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, my good friend Jonas Estal 
the artist is launching a campaign for collectivizing Facebook. And I think that's extremely relevant today to put those questions on the table as well. Right. Uh, final question before we have to leave you for a bit. Um, who is responsible for the uh, providing the base or providing access to, to those uh, pr f facilities? Uh, is that the government? Is that uh, the task of the government to not um, enhance uh, uh, capitalism in that sense or, or neoliberalism? Do they have to provide that base? I still believe so. I don't think that all the responsibility has to come onto the individual because unfortunately uh, there are very different conditions. So I believe that there should be a base provided by the government. And I also, going back to the conversation before with Farid, I believe also in transnational governments, uh, transnational alliances. And in this moment, uh, the European Union is uh, having a very challenge, important challenge behind, uh, in front, and I hope they will be at the level. Thank you so much. Please stay online with us uh, because I would like to return to you later in the program. But for now, uh, thank you so much. And would like to turn to Farid again. Let's talk to you in a bit, Marina. Thank you. Um, that was a great conversation. <laughs> that was it. Wow. <laughs> It's very inspiring to hear Absolutely. that. And I, I totally agree with you. But um, the changing role of, 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 of government, of politicians in that sense, is that the new way that we have to head to? Because you could say, if you look at the past decades, politics changed into short-term electoral institutions that, um, you know, where electoral gain or electoral support is very important and the long-term vision wasn't always there. Um, what we're doing now, what we're seeing now is that politicians are promoting um, a, a kind of a solidarity and collaborating and hopefully are developing visions for a longer term. Is that something that is sustainable for future or is this just this period and after this period, it's yeah. gone again. Yeah, great question. Um, but I, I, th I mean, the model we're working with now when it comes to the representative de democracy was a great model for the last last hundred years uh, for most people. Uh, but is it a model which helps us uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this time of, of permanent change? I, do, I don't think so. And we see many initiatives, some citizens, uh, like, the, the, like, the, like the G1000 uh, started in Belgium, but also in the Netherlands and other countries, where you say, what happens if you put people uh, uh, next to a table, 10 of them, and discuss the big issues? And what do citizens themselves then agree upon if you put them on a table from all diverse backgrounds? And actually, they, they manage quite well to find the right solutions. So I'm not saying, let's get rid of the representative democracy and we should have other types of democracy, but why don't we have different modes next to each other mm -hmm. to make sure that we can use the resources, the scar resources we have, with different models of, of discussion. Mm -hmm. In the German-speaking part of Belgium, they now have um, um, a citizens' council uh, based on a lottery. Mm -hmm. and so people are just like the old times from the Italian, uh, the it Italian city-states from, from back then. Uh, it was, was based on a, city, a system of the lottery, only for the, the sons of the rich families of back course. then. But, <laughs> but, but now it's, it's, a, it's a random lottery in the German-speaking part of Belgium, next to the representative democracy. So yeah. we, can, we have to explore new ways of giving voice to people and therefore make it inclusive and, as you say yourselves, try to solve the problem we have with the current representative system. Am I too attached to the old system to <laughs> say that the lottery idea scares me immensely? Because yeah, I, there are a couple of people that I do not want to have <laughs> uh, any any power at all. No, no okay, that's, well, that's, that's mean, too black and white, of course. I'm, 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 well, I, what, what's interesting, I think, uh, maybe also for, for the further discussion later on, it's interesting. Are we going to adopt one new model mm. or is it something, do we have, do we need different models based on principles next to each other? Yeah. And yeah. see what happens, uh, what works next, what happens now. And I, and I like the idea that the last 200 years were stable and it was, mm. was functional and it, and it worked like that. But for a certain amount of people, it has been misused the last couple of decades. And we see the increasing uh, uh, issue with, uh, with, uh, with solidarity and with uh, the increase of wealth. So I'm not sure this current system is, is, is doing that well when it comes to our, yeah. our, uh, our resources. So I'm, I'm in favor of exploring new ways. Well, the, the momentum at the moment is there. There is this crisis. There is need for change. Um, but if we look back at different other crises in the past, uh, we weren't very successful in adapting and changing society at that moment. If you look at the banking crisis, um, at that moment there was an idea of we have to change the system, we have to change the neoliberalism or the capital, the capitalist system as well. 
at that moment, everybody agreed on that. But then everything kind of recovered and yeah. that idea, you know, it has passed. Yeah, that's that's true. On the other hand, we know there's n there's no system which is going to be there for, for the rest of its life. So uh, so there will be a change. When is the change? Well, you're you're right. The banking crisis was, was a good crisis. It never wasted a good crisis. We wasted it. <laughs> uh, well, there's another crisis with many debts. With lots of lots of poor people being 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 uh, being uh, being uh, being in big trouble now, so it's not something to look forward to. It's not good that we have a crisis, but let's see what's happening. Let's see what the momentum is, the undercurrents over societies, and we can make these undercurrents uh, well systematic and and make it for the better. Right. I think that's our challenge, and oh, we're here. Smart people, let's do it. <laughs> it is a challenge. Um, you brought some clips with you uh, in did. order to illustrate some ideas that you have. Yeah. Uh, let's start with uh, the first clip. Can you describe what we're going to see? Yeah, so we're going to see, we're going to the European Commission, ah, uh, nice. which, uh, which made a great announcement last week when it comes to what can European solidarity mean for citizens of Europe. Hmm. Let's have a look. Yeah. Cool. So today, besides liquidity and other support, we are introducing a new proposal to kind of preserve the, the vibrant heart of the European economy, and this is its skilled workforce. The lockdown paralyzed the demand and it paralyzed the supply. Many companies are now left with no income, and if we do nothing, they have to lay off their workers, their employees. And this has, as a consequence, when the engine will restart, when the world economy will restart, they will not have the skilled workforce they need to take the offers. So we will lose markets, and uh, this will limit our recovery. And this is why we introduced today SURE. SURE is Europe-supported short-time work. It can mitigate the effects of the recession. It keeps people in work. It enables companies to return to the market with renewed vigor. The Commission will provide loans to those member states that need them to strengthen their short-time work schemes. These schemes now exist and are planned straight across the European Union. So sure can benefit all member states who want to use it. We can mobilize 100 billion euros to do this, and this will be made possible thanks to member states' guarantees of 25 billion. And this, this is European... Wow. Yeah. Uh, so why, why I want to show this is... The, the idea behind this is let's let's keep people in their jobs mm -hmm. and train them for the next job. Mm -hmm. uh, because what a waste if now people become unemployed, uh, have to be reskilled anyway because our economies are changing so fast anyway. Mm -hmm. So we have this we need this big learning push. Let's use the crisis now and the un unemployment of people now. Mm -hmm. Give them this this this, this stable uh, income, income they need, yeah. which the European Commission now gives to member states, and then they can use the time. To actually get a scale which is usable for the for the for the for the future, I think is I th that a realistic scenario? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this this is the this is the the, the European Commission uh, chairman, so is chairperson, so <laughs> that she knows it, right? So that doesn't always ensure us no, to have a realistic no, no. scenario. Um, it's it's it, I mean, we get the opportunity, use the opportunity. Mm. Is it realistic? I'm, I'm sure many companies, many member states are, are watching and thinking this is this is completely up our sleeve. Uh, uh, it was said also in the conversation, uh, Estonia is a country which really is really thinking well about the the current possibilities of technology and how to use them for the better of of their of their citizens. There are many countries, many regions, many cities which are taking next step. Not everybody, no, not everybody. Mm. Uh, but if we have uh, forefront of, of a coalition of the willing, the others will follow. Right. Um, so hopefully uh, uh, there will be enough people willing to uh, experiment with this. Right. Um, Marina, what's your vision on that clip? What do you think of it? Yeah, no, I agree with uh, Farid. And also uh, going back to the previous point about the G20, I also think that these new forms of governance are, are interesting. 
So uh, I think in a combination of uh, when I was previously talking about the government as a form of support, mm -hmm. I think uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to uh, reimagine the institutions we have and make them perhaps more resilient themselves. So, and that means that uh, experiments like, like the G20 are perfect uh, platforms to imagine what uh, democracy might mean. And I think this is a good moment to do it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm rushing a little bit because you've got two other clips that you I would have like to share clips, with us. And they're both so great. <laughs> for now, for something completely different, what's the second clip that you would oh, like to show us? Oh, the second clip. Yes, we're, we're going into an escape room <laughs> with two quite famous people. Let's have a look. Okay, see, that's what I thought they were going to do. Uh -oh. okay. <laughs> I think we're supposed to go. I think it's time for us to leave, Will. Let's go and escape um, the room. Yeah. All right, just so you all know, like, we don't know anything. You know the rules. Yes. Follow me. So we're following you. Know the rules, sir? We do not know the rules. No one told me the rules. And it's always scary when somebody says, you know the rules. All right, all so right. any questions, comments, concerns, derogatory remarks or otherwise? Uh, no. Feel pretty no. good. Okay. You will um, be blindfolded. Oh, Whoa. Fantastic. I'll be leading you in one at a time. So if oh, I'm not tragedy. leading you in, do not. Tragedy. This isn't usually how I like to be blindfolded. I'll start with. Oh man. Oh you. man. Oh. I've been. I'm being let in. Stay here. Sorry, Stay here. Gentlemen. Okay. Hi. I wasn't looking. Your turn. Oh, you. Play nice. Welcome to military prison. You are being detained for espionage. All right, I'm in an escape room with Will Smith somewhere. I don't know where he's gone. You may be thinking about escaping. Well, if that's the case, then you've got to think and act like a spy. <laughs> think and act like a spy. I said now for something completely different. I guess that some member states regard the European Union as a kind of an escape room. <laughs> but again, over to you, Farid. Why did you bring this clip well, for they're us? They're successfully escaping, by the way. They are successfully escaping. Well, I don't know. He's in hospital yeah, right okay, now. Exactly, exactly. And what's, uh, what's successful in this, in this sense. Um, I like the example of an escape room because we're talking about networks, about resilience. And... What happens if you go into an escape room with a group of people who are all a bit like you? Who have the same lifestyle, same way of thinking. You get into an escape room, you know the concept, you have to solve all these different uh, difficult puzzles. That you get out of an escape room with a team of people which are like you, the chances are not that big you get out. Because you need diverse ways of thinking to solve complex issues which are in this escape room and you have to finish them in time because otherwise you can't, can't get out. Mm. So the escape room is an, a great example that resilient networks solving complex issues can only be done if your network is of diverse, mm. is of diverse ages, diverse thinking, diverse uh, skills, et cetera, et cetera. If you have a way of communi communicating with each other, mm. uh, abridging these differences, because that's also what needed, of course, mm -hmm. if you can't abridge the differences, you can't get out. But if you can do so, you're really effective in solving the complex issues in an ever-changing time. Yeah, but I, th I, I, at one hand, I do agree because I think that, that diversity is key. But on the other hand, diversity can also lead to conflict and to miscommunication. Um, you have to spend some time in order to develop that communication you were talking about, in order to have that strength of diversity. But isn't diversity also... Um, um, like we're at the moment now, it's 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 it, you have to change. You have to change your own ways of thinking to include others, and that change can hurt or fr be frustrating at times as well. This is this is not an easy path. I never said that the liquid society. Uh, it's it's tough, and it's mm. not going to be easy. But if we want to solve all the complex things we are facing now on all the different levels, then we have to embrace this. And this is a great example of how we can do it. It lo lots of energy is needed and lots of in, in, uh, interventions. Absolutely right, but it's the only way. Right. We're going to see your last clip. Can you introduce it for us? Yes, fascinating. <laughs> so we see here uh, the director, the boss of the biggest investment uh, fund in the world, so the biggest investor in the world in all these companies, and he wrote a fascinating letter and he explains in a minute this letter. Let's see. Um, there's been a big debate since you put this letter out. A lot of people uh, applauding it, but other people mm -hmm. uh, being critical as well, where you've effectively suggested that it's not just profit uh, that you're after as an investor, but that to get to that profit, you think that these companies need to have a social purpose, which 
is, is a little bit stepping out uh, in a way. I mean, maybe, maybe people, you maybe don't think it's stepping out. Uh, well, no, I don't think it's stepping out. I think I'm actually recon, reconfirming what, uh, Milton, what Milton Friedman said. Um, if you read his whole essay that everyone talks about, um, he talks about that you need to be connected in your community, especially for small companies back then in 1970. Um, as global companies who are here in Davos, we have communities everywhere and we have to be connected with every community. But the most important thing I said, and I repeated maybe three times, profits are paramount to everything a company does. Uh, they, and, and their connectivity with their shareholders is, 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 a, is about profits. What I did say though, to remain um, in front of change, to be a part of a growth environment, I believe the, the involvement in a community to have a purpose is vital for long-term survivability, but long-term profitability. Why did you want to well, share this? This is fascinating, no? <laughs> this is the head of capitalism. Yeah. And, and he says, uh, you, you can be critical, huh? it is, this is a marketing trick, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. It, it probably is, it probably is. But just listen to the words and not think it's BlackRock, but just, I mean, these are, these, he's right, right? I mean, apart from that he should do it and he's not doing enough. Exactly. I, I, I totally agree. But if even these people are, are turning that long-term commitment, long-term thinking, a purpose, a purpose is crucial in this time of permanent change. It was pretty beautiful, beautiful said in your earlier conversation. Um, we need a base. The base is finding the right purpose. Um, but isn't that easy said when you are speaking from a privileged position, when you're speaking from a position that in, in a sense abused or misused the capitalist, capitalist system for their own gains and when you finally accumulated all the wealth, it's good to say, well, we have to change our ways. I agree. So let's keep them to, the, to their words. Uh -huh. so they're using it, they're, they're saying it. I think we believe we need purpose in, in a liquid society. So build this purpose with each other, with everybody included. That's the need for diversity because otherwise it's not going to work. Right. Marina, uh, how you, you mentioned like the, the providing the base. We can also look at those big companies that are, you know, very fluent and very wealthy in order to provide that base. Um, how do you regard that clip that we just saw? And is it feasible to have them being accountable for, for providing the base? Well, I mean... I want to maybe just repeat what um, a very uh, uh, a Dutch person said in Davos last year, like taxes, taxes, taxes. <laughs> so I think that is fundamental for these companies. Uh, we don't need some small gifts. We need they to pay taxes. Um, but also I agree with Farid in uh, the idea of purpose is extremely important. And maybe we think about this accumulation of wealth and this, uh, you know, functioning of many uh, businesses and big corporations, and they don't have any purpose. For instance, all these uh, big uh, financial markets that are only based on speculation, maybe we have to start thinking about why are such an important part of our society and how they are able to dictate that much our lives. Uh, because I don't see that much purpose on them, for instance. Right. And, and can you finally, to close things off, because we're almost at the end of the program, what is the role of the creative industry in order to provide that change or provide new scenarios? I think we need to be, I, again, I agree with Farid in this idea of being experimenting um, with, uh, um, without uh, actually being scared of making mistakes and be able to reimagine other worlds. That was what we do, and that's what we have to do right now, to mm -hmm. put our energy in imagining other forms of living together. Mm -hmm. Farid, thank you so much, Marina. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Farid, um, in our final minutes together, um, you know, look into your glass orb <laughs> and predict the future. Uh, we will be here in five years' time again. In five years, okay. Right. It's not too long. This is like the, yeah, the immediate yeah, 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 future. Yeah, yeah. Um, in what situation will we be here? Has the transformation happened already? Are we in a bigger crisis than we are now? Are we experiencing the aftermath of all the deep pockets that all European governments provide to the citizens? Um, I mean, I mean, I think the banking crisis is nothing compared to what we're currently facing. So, so never waste a good crisis. I do think that the tendencies already present in, in, our, in our societies are now going to be on the forefront mm -hmm. and that we are getting used to this, to this new reality. And 
try to make this reality as inclusive as prosperous um, um, uh, for uh, the biggest part of our societies as possible. Right. Thank you so much for your contribution. Well, this was already it. I feel that the time just passed so quickly. Um, this is always our second edition of We Make the City Reset. Next Monday, we will be back with another edition. If you would like to check out our website to see all the other programs that we will be live casting uh, tonight, uh, this week, please do so. And if you would like to make a contribution, you can also go to the website. But there's also a QR code on the website that you can scan and all the contributions that you make will benefit the programs directly in these, well, challenging times. Thank you so much for our guests for being here and contributing. And thank you so much for Pakai Susweiger, the crew and the program makers in order to provide us with the opportunity to have the conversation with you people at, at home. Um, I will see you next week and thank you for now and bye-bye.